Vincent. Uh, I lead the Identity Access Management Program at uh, Canadian Pension Plan Investments, uh, formerly known as CPPIE. Uh, this being a CISO forum, um, I wanted to remind those of you who are CISOs uh, or aspiring CISOs uh, or work closely with the CISO in your organization that uh, privilege access management uh, in particular, uh, but identity in general, are typically uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, portfolio in a CISO, CISO organization, uh, both in terms of budget, in terms of uh, size and headcount of the organization, as well as being some of the most time consuming and uh, unfortunately sometimes some of the most troublesome aspects of what a CISO is concerned with. And uh, in fact, the gentleman that uh, I've had a privilege of working with for uh, some time and is a former CISO uh, has a saying where he says, uh, um, identity is the hill that the CISOs die on. So I think that uh, mm, uh, demonstrates how important and critical uh, PAM programs and identity programs are within, within an organization. Uh, so the focus of today's conversation is uh, around key interlocking strategies for successful PAM implementation. Um, and what we want to focus on are uh, things that make a PAM program successful and uh, some of the pitfalls and where um, things uh, lead for uh, limited success or even sometimes failures. Uh, before we get going on this one, I just want to uh, uh, put out a disclaimer. Uh, that uh, what, what I'm talking about here today are my personal views. They're in no way, shape, or form reflect uh, any past, current, or uh, future directions, strategies, uh, set up, and operations at uh, CPP Investments. And with that, uh, why don't we do a level set in terms of what, what we mean by uh, privilege access management. So all access, as you know, uh, create uh, uh, or introduce new threat vectors in your environment and increase your threat, uh, threat surface. Now, having said that, not all uh, access is made the same and not, not all of them have the, create the same level of threat uh, to your organization. So privileged access management um, is the discipline, or this is how I define it, discipline of rigorously identifying, governing, controlling, and securing access that has, that has proportionally higher likelihood of causing harm or damage to your organization in case of a breach or a misuse. Um, there are three broad categories of what is considered privileged access. So first one are non-personal privileged accounts or shared accounts. These are generic accounts that are shared by a group of individuals or colleagues within the organization. And the reason uh, we consider these privileged is because uh, by the virtue of being shared, the uh, personal accountability for the usage of these credentials are diluted. And when you don't have accountability, personal accountability, that's where you introduce threat to your environment. Example of those are built-in accounts such as roots, DP, DBAs, group IDs uh, that are shared by a group of individuals to say, for example, patch servers and fire IDs or break glass IDs. Second category of personal uh, privileged accounts are personal privileged accounts. These are accounts or credentials that have elevated privileges, they have admin type privileges, and naturally, you know, uh, they can change the behavior of a system or an application. Um, they have uh, more than uh, regular business operations uh, permissions on them, and that introduces threat to your environment. So uh, infrastructure accounts, such as accounts with domain administrator uh, capabilities and privileges, and also business application accounts. So your HRIS administrator, for example. And then uh, the third category would be non-human credentials. These are credentials that are used by applications and systems to talk to one another. Um, and the reason these are considered privileged is because the password for them aren't typically changed very often. They're not behind multi-factor authentication. And uh, they sit on the system communicating back and forth. So deciphering the patterns of behavior for them and in case of a breach or misuse becomes difficult. Uh, example of these are non-interactive serv uh, service accounts, database accounts, uh, web services accounts, and also interactive ones that are used by uh, robotics, by RPA. So having said that, let's talk a little bit about uh, typical objectives and goals of an IAM program, uh, of a PAM program. So the first one would be increase security and reduce risk. So 
this, this is the primary objective typically for a PAM program. And what we really want to uh, get out of it is to reduce excessive access, enable good decisions, and also curtail errors and emissions. So that's, that's one way that a PAM program increases security and reduces risk and uh, helps uh, boost the security and risk uh, posture of the organization. The next uh, typical goal of a PAM program is boosting operational efficiencies by um, automating manual controls and uh, making the lives of your end users easier. And uh, the third one, the third typical goal, is to enable innovation and transformation by accelerating digital transformation, reducing time to value, as well as aligning your PAM program, your IEM program, and your cybersecurity program in line with uh, enterprise goals. Now, let's talk about interlocking strategies. Now, the four interlocking strategies that I want to talk speak to you about today, and none of them are controversial. Uh, I think we all agree that they're important uh, aspects of a successful strategy. Uh, and if somebody disagrees, they're gonna probably have a hard time <laughs> arguing that. So first one, going with industry best practices. Second one, focusing on goals and outcomes. Third one, centralizing and consistently operating controls. And then engaging and involving business early on. Now, what do these mean? And this is, this is how we're gonna get into it. S specific items that uh, are often missed or overlooked when it comes to any of these uh, four strategies for successful PAM implementation. And as you would imagine, you know, we, t we talk about interlocking, they do, uh, have a lot of synergies between them. There's a lot of interconnectivity, and uh, um, they, they all tie together. And, and we'll, you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So the first one, going with industry best practices. Um, again, not, not a very controversial topic. I think we all, as part of our impl PAM implementations, want to go with industry best practices, but a couple of key items here to speak about. One is improving existing processes and controls. This means as you go about implementation of your PAM program and standing up a PAM technology, don't use a technology to automate bad controls. Take, as, as we spend the time and the budget and effort and sweat and tears in many cases, uh, take the time to improve the existing processes and controls. Uh, automating legacy processes that are not in line with industry good practices is often one of the ways that uh, PAM programs aren't very successful. And uh, the other one that, the, that, is, that is a byproduct of the first is um, trying to engineer for or automating edge cases. Um, in, a, in, a, in many organizations, uh, your legacy processes and controls, things that are there before you start your PAM program or refresh your PAM program lead you to engineering for edge cases. One example of uh, the first one, improving existing uh, process and controls I wanna bring up. So I've, I've worked with an organization not too long ago uh, where um, there's an approval process for creation of what, what, what would be considered privileged accounts. And in this particular organization, the existing process was to have the lead, uh, the business lead to approve the creation, to be part of the approval for the, for the, uh, for the creation of privileged accounts. Now, this person typically in that organization was a managing director, a senior director, or sometimes even a VP for some units, and this person would not have any visibility into this. So mm, they would often rely on the middle management, the technical leads, to come and uh, justify and approve and review this particular request. Once this was highlighted to them, um, they, they, they fully understood that and they, they realized that the top level person does not have the visibility and they, has, they have to rely on somebody at the technical level and often below them to come and give a thumbs up. Now, what they did was they did automate the process for a multi-tier approval process that would still include the top person. Now, this was automated, not a lot of effort, but as you would imagine, you need five of these decision, bad decisions to you know, add 10% to your overall effort. 
and uh, that person was still part of it, which was completely unnecessary. They were never going to approve without the person under, under them to say yes, and if the person under said, said no, they would never say yes to it. So it was always that middle person that approved. So this was an opportunity to eliminate the top level approval and rely on the person who has the visibility. And for engineering for automating, sorry, uh, uh, engineering for uh, edge cases, um, a healthcare organization, again, not too long ago, where they had a tool, a legacy tool from a very long time ago, and they insisted on automating the privilege access management controls for this particular platform um, where you know the existing process was manual, ended up being an edge case. This particular tool did not come with, uh, did not support industry protocols, standard protocols for uh, uh, implementation and integration. And uh, us as practitioners, the vendor of the PAM uh, platform did highlight the deficiencies when it comes to security. In, in fact, it was at the end of the day when everything was to be completely done in, 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 the, in the happy path, there were still uh, deficiencies in this particular in, uh, implementation. This ended up being a 15 to 20% approximately of the overall effort with minimal return on it. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, ev ev everybody agreed that this, this was a faulty implementation for integration. So streamlining processes and easy to operate controls getting the biggest bang for the buck for, automation, for the automation buck, for the automation effort. And one thing about to, to be said about uh, edge cases is that they consume disproportionate the amount of time and effort of your uh, implementation effort. And they typically come with uncommon and unsupported engineering problems and solutions. So avoiding that is one, one way to uh, make your PAM implementation successful. Next one is focusing on goals and outcomes. Uh, what, what I mean here is taking the stock of where you want to be uh, from a PAM perspective and aligning your goals with the enterprise goals, defining the goals clearly and sticking to them and keeping them in mind. The solution here is not the technology. Technology is always the the, tool, the, the means to automate the solution. So keeping the goal in mind, the outcome in mind, and then applying the technology to automate the solution. That is, th that is one of the key aspects of this, uh, this, this uh, specific strategy. The other thing to keep in mind is, as you go about doing your uh, implementation of your, of your PAM program, keeping in mind that this will not end at the conclusion of your PAM implementation. This is not just technology, it's, it's the whole picture, and also this, this program you're putting in place, this mechanism you're putting in place is gonna have to live as long as your organization lives. In fact, I've never seen a I, I identity or a PAM project that goes away uh, at some point. Um, anytime you do implement it, you end up running it for the, for the duration of as, as long as your company lives. So keeping that in mind is very important. A um, couple of things to be said here when we're talking about focusing on goals and outcomes. Um, the ultimate indicator of success for a PAM program is determined at your C level or above it when they gauge the value of, of, the, of the program and the investment in the program for the whole organization. Um, so focusing purely on the technology misses the point. You can have a very successful implementation project uh, where technology stood up in a stable fashion, uh, on time and on budget, but when you go high enough where the ultimate uh, arbiters of whether or not something is successful determine that it doesn't add any value to the organization. And that's, that's often because even though you may have determined your goals early on as part of the implementation, that that, that line of sight is lost. Um, and the other thing to be said about that, and we, um, going back to what I just said around, uh, keeping in mind that this implementation is gonna lead to operations and is gonna live as long as your company lives, 
when, when the focus is not on the goals and the outcomes of the program, and that gets lost in, uh, in the middle of your implementation, you often end up with ecosystems that are hard to sustain. Uh, you've ended up creating a program where at the, end, at the conclusion of the implementation, it's hard to, for business to integrate with, it's, it's hard, the controls are uh, often difficult to um, sustain by your operations teams. And you get into a situation or condition where you, you, you end up in this perpetual cycle of costly impl implementation, recurring year over year, you have to go and pop the hood again and start doing uh, costly implementations to, to, to keep this running and make it workable. I'm not talking here about you know, regular main maintenance and expansion and onboarding into, into the PAM program. I'm talking about making drastic changes on a, on a periodic basis. Uh, so next one, centralization and consistent consistency in operating controls. Again, not a very controversial topic. Uh, I think we all uh, agree that this is a good thing and this is a good strategy for a successful PAM implementation. Again, few things um, get lost in this uh, in this translation, or during lost in, get lost in translation and get overlooked during the implementation. One of the aspects that I want to talk about is when, when we talk about centralization and consistency, we, what we want to do is we want to avoid piecemeal and siloed view of controls. Um, again, we're talking interlocking. As, as you keep goals in mind, devising your crop, uh, controls and processes to match with your goals and keeping that at the, at the forefront of your, your, your mind as you go about your implementation. One example here is uh, with, with an organization, I mean, we all work in complex and complicated uh, computing footprint environments. Uh, a lot of times we are working with uh, a cloud or hybrid cloud model. And that's where you know, a lot of the effort in managing privileged access in those organizations come from. Um, one example is an organization that did have a robust PAM program. Um, they did try to control access, privileged access to their data infrastructure. Now, in this complex environment, you're talking about IaaS, infrastructure as a service, PaaS, platform as a service, and uh, um, software as a service. Now, because the goals are not uh, kept at the forefront, and the, the issue of centralization and consistency isn't uh, as a result of that isn't at the forefront and is not a strategy that they're oper executing on. What happened is they, they did go after their S3 as their IaaS uh, uh, data infrastructure and controlling the privileged access to that, but then we got to PaaS and e EDS, they completely missed that. So having that centralized view, having that centralized uh, and consistent application of controls across the board uh, is, is quite important. A lot of times uh, in many organizations, they, they, they apply it at the low level of the infrastructure, but at the middle tier and uh, business layer, that, that, that gets lost. So that's important to keep in mind because that dilutes the effectiveness of the controls that you're putting in place. And also, another aspect of centralization and control is, uh, a lot of times when it, when it, when it comes to uh, centralizing controls, uh, this ends up being translated into organizational restructuring. Now, organizational restructuring, ipso facto, is not a bad thing. Uh, a lot of times necessary. Uh, but subjecting the success of your PAM program to that organizational restructuring adds a layer of complexity that you don't need in your life. Um, there, there's a couple of instances in the past where this exact situation has happened, in my experience, where centralization of control has been translated or has been characterized as restructuring an organization with a global footprint, bringing various uh, operations teams and uh, administrative teams together under the same umbrella um, and breaking down the barriers between shadow IT. Again, I'm not a fan of shadow IT. I don't think anybody here is. It's good to get rid of it, but subjecting 
the success of your PAM program, for that restructuring to happen, for shadow ID to go away, that again is a complexity you don't need to, in your life and it, it creates a dependency that puts things out of your hand. So it's important to keep in mind that centralization and consistently, consistent application of controls doesn't, shouldn't necessarily mean an organiza organizational restructuring and you, you shouldn't uh, subject the success uh, of your program um, to, to that fact. Um, yeah, so consistent coverage, we talked about that, uh, having a smooth transition between various layers when you apply the controls. And then um, f f on the flip side, um, av mm, avoiding uh, resistance when it comes to change, when it comes to restructuring, that's important, and uh, avoiding unnecessary friction. Uh, so next one, this is an important one. Engaging business uh, early and involving them. Again, I think everybody agrees that's a good thing. Uh, where things uh, go sideways in a PAM program is a lot of times this becomes the purview and uh, um, uh, the, 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 the What's the word? Um, it becomes the purview and the uh, area of jurisdiction of cybersecurity technology or the compliance teams. Business is not involved in this. And that is, that is often a problem. Uh, having the business understand the value that you bring to the table becomes quite important. All of us in cybersecurity are invariably are in in a situation where we're a cost center, not just the cost of the headcounts and the technologies and the cost of operation of the technologies and tools, but also there's a cost associated with the business coming on board with us. Uh, and they're often the generating, uh, money generating aspect of the business, right? So, or the organization. So we need to make sure that they understand the value we bring to the table and we need to align the goals to the goals of the business. And this goes back to how these things are interlocking. We talked about that earlier on. So we, we need to have them involved. And a couple of challenges with this. One is um, speaking a language that business understands. I always say that uh, identity in general, but PAM in particular, is like sailing. It's got its own language. We, we have our own terminologies. For us, it's not hiring, transfers, and terminations is joiner, mover, lever. Um, and it goes on and on like that. Being able to articulate the value we bring in and, assign, and aligning our goals with the goals of the business and making them understand, that becomes quite important. The other important point here is um, a lot of times where business is disengaged and uninterested is because it's direction from above. So it's easy for within a, within a uh, uh, say bank, right? For the head of retail banking to direct all everybody in their organization to come to the table, work with the cybersecurity and the PAM teams and play ball. Uh, same thing with uh, the, the, the investment arm. Uh, it's, and that typically is what's, what's happening. What's missing is we often have to work with the middle layer. We have to often work with the technology teams and being integrated with them is important. Um, that push from above is necessary. That support and mandate from above is necessary, but we need to bring to the fold the middle managers, the technical teams on board with us to make sure that they, they understand the value of what we bring to the table and they're, they're supportive of it. And without that, the message to, to, to the top of their organization, to the top of that investment arm, to the top of the retail banking, that message gets lost. And the resistance and friction that that creates without having that integration with those teams and them understanding the goals and the value, that, uh, 
resistance and friction translates up top to the business being disengaged. Now, when business is engaged, obviously, be, oh, well, maybe not so obvious, but what happens is, again, where success gets determined, they don't see the value. They don't see why we were spending all this time and money, why we're bothering them, why we're at the door knocking periodically. And uh, a lot of times, in especially large organizations, PAM programs becomes this mm, plaything that the cybersecurity, this boondoggle that cybersecurity is in, in, engaged in. So we want to avoid that. We want to we be uh, uh, tightly coupled with business and make them understand that this is important to them and this is actually a service that they need. Um, one of the things that uh, is also important is if when, when they don't see the value, they, they also lack visibility into the challenges that, that we have. Uh, why things need to be changed, why you, you need change requests, why you need more other people at the table. They, they don't see the challenges because they don't see the value. So that becomes another problem here. So in short, four interlocking strategies, and I think, I hope that you saw how all of them are connected and they're all tied to one another. Going with industry best practices, improving the existing process and controls and not automating bad processes, avoiding engineering and automating for edge cases, um, and then focusing on goals and outcomes where we understand and we make everybody in the organization understand that this is not a tech, that technology is not the solution here. We have goals, we have uh, objectives and outcomes. Technology is coming in to automate part of it, an important part of it, but nonetheless a part of it. And uh, the fact that this will not end when technology implementation project is over. This will continue to live on. Centralization, we talked about that. A piecemeal and siloed view is, is never good. It creates blind spots, and that's where bad things happen. And uh, not making this about uh, organizational restructuring and creating friction. Uh, and then engaging business uh, early on and keeping them uh, tuned in and maintain their, their buy-in, important because that's where they see the value. They gotta see the value into this. They gotta, they gotta be partners in, in all, that, all the things that we do. They gotta work with us to overcome challenges and also not making it sound like this is a IT thing or a cybersecurity thing. This is everybody's business. With that, I wanna first thank the good folks here at CyberX and also our friends at uh, Tech Democracy for uh, sponsoring this. Any questions? Thank you. How are we going? Uh, did, uh, it, it is important to bring the middle management technical teams on board, and how are we going to go about doing that? So one of the ways uh, I've tried to do that in the past is um, start the education with with them. St start talking about what is, you know, what what is privilege. see it exist in their organization and try to collaborate and refine that understanding. When, when, when I go talk to a particular application team, going in with some understanding that you, you're, you're, you're running a certain application, this is your infrastructure, these are what I think would be your privileged credentials, this is how I believe uh, risk is introduced and this is how I think is going to, uh, we're going to resolve this together. So going to the table with some level of understanding, not going with a blank slate, basically, and then working with them to refine that understanding. 
that, you know what, this is not a problem for us, for example. This particular thing that Roosevelt mentioned, this is, this is, not, a, this is not an issue for us. Or they, you, you missed an area. You, there's something else that would be considered an area of risk that you haven't talked about. So creating that common understanding between us and then uh, working with them uh, to bring them to the table. A lot of times what happens is these folks have, have a day job too. Um, privileged access is not all that they do. Uh, it's not a big portion of their time and they're not gonna be on it for a, for a long period of time. Their involvement is periodic. So having an understanding, working with their times and also making sure that you know, if, if I'm working with a team you know, once every quarter, this person has done a million things between now and three months ago when I last talked to them. So bringing them to the table refreshing their memory, making sure that we're still on the same page and refreshing that understanding and that alliance and partnership. I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. Sorry. Is uh, any industry best? Um, to be honest, there's no one industry uh, standard here. Now, when it comes to implementation, uh, going with some frameworks, and a lot of them look fairly similar in this regard. So going with recommendations on ISO, going with NIST, I think those are common and good uh, frameworks to go by. But we, we also have to keep in mind, I, don't, I hope that answers the question, by the way. Is this where we're headed? Okay. Um, keep, keeping in mind that, um, NIST, th frameworks like NIST and ISO, they, they don't, they're, they're prescriptive to a certain degree. So they, they, they leave things open for interpretation. So what I mean by that is that, you know, you, you, they, they should act as guideline, but at the same time, you need to go and define the particulars of the control and the process. So it's, it's not a matter of just picking something from ISO or NIST. In my experience, it requires to be refined and made applicable to the specific needs and goals of the organization. I hope that answered your question. Sorry. Yeah, so my question is, um, I see how this applies to people kind of working in the same place. Yes. But most of us have inherited a lot of garbage. <laughs> Very good question. So the question is, you know, a lot of us do inherit a, an environment that's less than ideal, or I'm going to borrow your term and say garbage. Uh, how, how do we go around clean, cleaning what we've inherited? Because cleanup usually comes with, with the overhead of friction and resistance to change and a lot of unknowns. That, like you said, it, like it, there's a whole bunch of accounts here. We don't know what they do, so don't touch. We, we, we know they're problematic, but don't touch them. So. One of, one of the things that is important and this strategy helps is defining the goals. So if we've defined the goals up front, we brought the business together, we made them understand where, why this conversation is important, why privileged access management is important, how th things can go wrong here. And making it, in your specific example, uh, you use audit as an example. So there, there are audit findings and then you, you have to leave things untouched. One of the things I've, typically done and has been successful is to make business understand that compliance and meeting the comp uh, regulatory compliance requirements of the organization is important and needs to be there, but you can be fully compliant with a whole host of frameworks and regulatory compliance requirements, and at the same time, your cybersecurity is wide open and truck drives through it, basically. So making them understand that having no audit issues doesn't mean you don't have a cybersecurity problem, and this is more than compliance is a cybersecurity problem and help them understand that they need, it's difficult, they need to invest the time and you're gonna be on board with them. Obviously you may need to go and you know, go do your budgeting and financing and they have to do that work but 
make him understand this important and necessary aspect of what you do. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Sorry. Absolutely. So what the gentleman was mentioning, for those of you in here, so um, mm, s some of the things that worked in the past is, and I fully subscribe to that and um, agree with, is having an incremental approach and not trying to boil the ocean in one go. That, that, that helps often. Any more questions? Comments? General thoughts? 